So between grade one and grade two, there is an objective way of differentiating. One, it's immediately audible. The other is not immediately audible. Then if it becomes, if it's immediately audible, but louder than grade two, we call it a grade three. This is, a, this is very subjective. You know, what is louder than something? And uh, it's, uh, we come up with all of our, with all possible uh, answers to this question. So this is a, sub a subjective step. And in fact, many murmurs end up being graded two to three. You never know. First of all, it doesn't change the way we treat the patient, as we said. Then grade four is a loud murmur. A grade four, it's a loud murmur that you can't miss. You can't probably, possibly miss, even in a loud environment. But you have to have your stethoscope on the chest, of course. It's not just a joke. It's, it's, it's true. <laughs> then a grade five murmur is, uh, is a loud murmur, or you can call it a super loud murmur, without, with uh, a palpable thrill. So between four and five, there is an objective way to differentiate one from versus the other. There is or there is not a vibration that I can feel with my fingers. But in order to make your assessment sensitive, you have to wedge your fingers in between the intercostal space. Because if you put your fingers on the ribs, uh, you know, it takes a very intense thrill to dis kind of diffuse through the ribs. Uh, you have to wedge your, your fingertips in between two ribs to, to be able to tell for sure, no, there's not, or yes, there is a palpable thrill. And then a grade six, it's a very loud murmur with a palpable thrill. It can still be heard if you detach your stethoscope a bit from the chest wall and perhaps you just touch with, your, with, the, with the edge of your stethoscope, test, touch the chest wall, okay? This is a super loud murmur that can be heard even without the full, complete uh, adherence of your stethoscope to the chest wall. And that's pretty much all I have to say about auscultation. Uh, if not, do it uh, consistently every day. Uh, even in patients in which you don't suspect cardiac disease, just to get used to the way the heart sounds in a normal patient. Uh, the next topic is going to be even more uh, contradictory. It's non-invasive blood pressure measurements. Blood pressure really is something that should be checked, should be measured rather than estimated. But in order to measure blood pressure, you have to insert an arterial catheter which is something that is done in anesthesia very commonly, but is not done, of course, in clinical patient at all. So what we end up assessing is uh, the so-called non-invasive blood pressure, which is not a measurement, but just an, it's an estimate, because we're actually not sampling the, the, the event itself. So why do we care about blood pressure? Because it's a major regulator of cardiovascular function, and when it's uh, abnormal, it's, uh, you know, it's a leading cause, particularly in humans, of cardiovascular morbidity and mortality, thereby uh, assuming that our patients are similar to ourselves, we should integrate blood pressure measurement in, uh, you know, in just as part of the minimum database uh, of the evaluation of every patient. However, the risk of uh, getting a blood pressure out of every patient uh, in a pretty much unrestricted population um, leads to the risk of uh, stumbling into false positives and false negatives. That's the same as if we were running an ECG on every dog that walks through the door without any suspect. Just every single patient you see from now on, you run an EKG, you will stumble in a bunch of false positives and false negatives because it's a random population. It's not a population at high risk for. And, uh, so that's, and that's a totally different topic of uh, you know, um, sensitivity of screening and specificity of, of screening tools. But uh, I do believe we should uh, um, measure way more blood pressures than we're currently doing. And we in cardiology do it consistently because I've learned that you can you stumble in unrecognized forms of systemic hypertension, even in relatively young animals. Now, I don't know how much then that early diagnosis changes the, the natural outcome and the natural history of the disease, and nobody does. But. So uh, there is a decent source of information, uh, which is available for free for, uh, to everybody at this website, which is the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine website, it's the ACBM consensus. Uh, these are the guidelines that we have available. <clears throat> the only words of warning that I have for you on these guidelines is that uh, at some point in these guidelines, they propose some cutoff values, and they link these cutoff values of blood pressure to hypothesized risks of cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. 
but it's just a proposal. It hasn't been validated. So don't go and apply it to the clinical. It's just not very clear in the way this paper was written. It looks like, oh, we know it all. We know everything, and that's what we should do. But it's actually just a proposal. I was at the discussion, and in the discussion was made clear. It just does, it, they didn't state it nicely on the, on the written paper. But it's a great paper and, and, and a very good source of information for everybody. Every practice should uh, go through this, this paper and um, make sure all staff and doctors are on the same page as far as uh, blood pressure measurements. Again, we are estimating, and there are different methods of estimation. Uh, we can't use the sphygma manometry in our patients because we can't hear the tones that uh, you can hear on yourself if you check yourself, your, your own blood pressure. So we use either the Doppler, which is pretty good. Uh, it's very, very dependent on, uh, on um, operator skills, uh, but it's a very good, good tool. I, I like it in animals of less than 15 kilograms of body weight, and uh, it's my method of choice in patients with uh, abnormal heart rhythms. If you have a patient in atrial fibrillation, please don't try to use the Cardell, because it doesn't work. And then we have oscillom uh, the oscillometric devices, first, second, and third generation. This third generation guy here is the high sensitivity os oscillometric device. This is the Cardell, and this is the old Dynamap. Definitely the Dynamap didn't work in dogs of less than 15 kilograms of body weight. Cardell is pretty good, but uh, uh, still has issues with uh, with uh, abnormal heart rhythm, and I don't have experience with the third generation uh, models. Then this little thing here is an implantable uh, telemetric device uh, for, um, for the acquisition of 24 hours continuous blood pressure, but it's only used in, in, in research, and actually that's good for, for, for mice. It's pretty tiny. So uh, if there are three words I want to say about measurements are these three words up here, which I won't say because you can't read them very well. And so you've got to standardize a procedure, find an appropriate environment, avoid sedation. We avoid sedation pretty much for everything we do in cardiology because then you've got to interpret your data rather than just reading them. And um, particularly with blood pressure, sedation is really to be avoided. Um, it wouldn't be a bad idea to leave to give five to ten minutes of acclimatization to the patient. Uh, of course, gentle restraint, appropriate cuff selection, and you can see the you know the cutoffs there, which I'm, I'm sure are identical to the ones you use. Uh, there's really no uh, standardized or uh, way to to do it as far as site of sampling. Uh, it really depends on the PET confirmation and the, the tolerability. Some patients just don't tolerate the right front, they like the left front, uh, or user preferences. But the most important thing you can do, so choose whatever works for you and the patient, but write it down so that next time you recheck the pressure, of course, you do the same thing. And cuff size is important, is as important as site of sampling. Ideally, the same operator should re do all the blood pressure measurements in a practice, but definitely in a patient. Uh, there is good evidence that uh, multiple readings should be obtained, and that's what is stated in the guidelines. Uh, in the academic environments where I trained, we will always systematically acquire five readings, five consecutive readings, discard the one with the highest and the one with the lowest value, and average the three that are left. Uh, sometimes it's possible, so it's easy in an academia, we have 25 students, so we can just can't, don't have nothing to do but you know, getting 25 measurements for you. Uh, in, a, you know, in a practice can be a little more complicated, sometimes the, just the patient doesn't tolerate it. Uh, you're lucky if you can get one that you believe. But uh, uh, just to give you an idea, and I, I don't have the data here, but I asked for fun to Tanya, who should be somewhere, I asked for fun um, and she didn't know why I was asking her to get in all the patients two readings 30 seconds apart from each other. Then I, last night I ran some statistics. When if you look at the systolic, the diastolic and the mean values at, as a group, there's no statistically significant difference. But if you plot them in a certain way, you see that the difference between the first reading and the second reading becomes wider and wider as the pressure increases. To me, that's telling me that probably in a normal dog, it doesn't matter if you take it once or twice, but there are some, the dogs that are 
going to develop hypertension or those that are already hypertensive, even mildly hypertensive, it might make a big difference. And that pretty much confirms what the guidelines are saying. What we want to achieve with, um, with the multiple readings is to find at least three readings that are not that different from each other. You don't want to have the blood pressure all over the place and then you, know, you average it, your numbers, but you don't know what to discard. So less than 20% variability is acceptable whenever you're estimating a, a, a value rather than just measuring it. And of course, repeat it as necessary uh, until you get consistent readings. Now the problem comes not only in acquiring these values, but then what do, what do we do with these values? So um, it is important before you before we condemn a patient to lifelong antihypertensive treatment uh, to confirm that we are not dealing with white, white coat effect. Sometimes it's very hard to do. Sometimes it takes a lot of uh, uh, kind of uh, imagination, finding a way and creativity in finding a way such as, you know, um, checking the blood pressure in the owner's car, uh, or, but not in the hospital, definitely. So reliable measurements are most likely the measurements that you believe in because you know you're following a protocol and you know that you've got consistent readings with less than 20% variability. But then most of the time, we, I require, we require multiple measurements. I see a patient today, and the patient doesn't really have a lot of uh, ongoing systemic disorders that, I, that you know, would make that patient at the higher risk for the development of systemic hypertension, but I do have a high reading. I usually ask the client to come back two more times, separate days, with the least uh, stress on the patient as possible. And I want to confirm that state two more times. Because we are talking about condemning a patient to lifelong hypertensive treatment. Most of the time, we can't fix a systemic hypertension um, completely. So it's, uh, it is important to be 100% sure we are correctly diagnosing these patients. Then things are different if the patient is at risk, it's in a population at risk. If the patient has evidence of target organ damage, so the consequences of hypertension, that's different. Or if the patient has a disease that is well known to be a cause of systemic hypertension. Now let's go over these two categories. Let's start with target organ damage. There are ma many organs and or tissues that are severely damaged by chronic systemic hypertension. The vessels are the first one. The vessels are the, the oses that have prefer, first to deal with the high blood pressure. So variable degrees of, in a nutshell, thickening of the different layers of these vessels occur. It's, it's hard to, to see. When you, know, when you observe a patient, you can't see, OK, that patient has thick renal arteries. How can you do that? But that's, that's one of the target organ damage. There are nice windows that we can use. And uh, you know, fundic exam is. Uh, is the most important. We can see those vessels. And the hypertensive retinopathy is the most, the, one of the easiest uh, evidence of target organ damage at the vascular level because we have a window there. Hypertensive retinopathy or retinal detachment, like in this 17 year, years old Siamese dog with the symmetrical um, retinal detachment. Kidneys. The kidneys are an important organ to look at um, with echoes or with just the CAM panel in UA, see whether or not there's evidence of target organ damage. What makes everything complicated with the kidneys is the chicken egg issue. Is uh, the hypertension causing kidney disease or kidney disease is causing hypertension? But we know that we've got both. Cerebral vascular complications. Sometimes uh, we see cats with uh, behavioral abnormalities, for instance. And then a thick left ventricle. This is another important evidence of target organ damage. So if I have a reading that you know I might not be 100% sure, uh, but I do observe the presence of target organ damage in that patient, I believe that reading way more. 